from Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. Uh, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Uh, I decided as we're, as we're going through the Bible um, to, to actually skip First and Second Chronicles, not because I don't like First and Second Chronicles, uh, but because it's a lot of repeat from what we find in First and Second Kings. And so to avoid that repetition, um, not that repetition is bad, um, but some of the same key themes are found in First and Second Chronicles that are found in First and, First and Second Kings. So I move forward to the next book, which is Ezra, and uh, the Bible's not quite as concerned with chronology as, as we are. So in Ezra, uh, we're actually moving forward in time, and this is post-Babylonian exile. So Israel fell, uh, actually twice, because of their uh, faithlessness. Uh, the first time the north fell, northern Israel fell in 722 BC to the Assyrians, and then in 586 BC, the south fell uh, to the Babylonians. And so God, through his prophets, kept warning them over and over and over, if you abandon me and if you follow these idols, if you continue to follow them with your heart and you continue to oppress uh, innocent people, my wrath will come in and I will judge Israel. And the Israelites did what? They continued in their sin and God did what? Right? God... Uh, made the north fall in 722. He made the south fall in 586. By the way, this was pretty brutal uh, with these exiles. So exile means exactly that. The Israelites were exiled out of their land. Uh, many of them were, were uh, made slaves. They were put into slavery. And so you have what's called the diaspora. And these were people who were dispersed, Jewish people who were dispersed. And so enter the New Testament, where do you find Jewish people? Everywhere. That's because of these exiles. Many of them were exiled out, and uh, they started to spread all over the world. And so there are these pockets of Jewish populations all over the world. And they just never moved again. So they kept their families there for generations and generations. And so at the time of Jesus, you find Jewish populations all over the known world. Ezra is a really neat book because I, 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 I love Ezra, and I really wrestle when I read Ezra because Ezra was such an incredible person that this is one of those self-reflective books. As you read this, you say, why, why can't I be more like Ezra? Uh, Ezra had everything that made a good leader, he had humility. First and foremost, he had humility. Uh, he was an incredible, incredible man. He had boldness. Um, even though he feared what the king would say, uh, he boldly went to the king and he would ask him uh, for help. And this is not the Israelite king because they didn't have one at the time. Ezra was a priest. Ezra led the remnant who came back into Jerusalem. And I want you to keep in mind, and I want you to, to paint the scene a little bit. He comes into Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is in shambles. All right, there's rubble everywhere. The temple, which was once the iconic symbol in, in not only Jerusalem, but in all of Israel, is now just a pile of, of tattered rocks and dust and debris. In fact, in Nehemiah, uh, we're going to find next week, when Nehemiah came in, there was so much rubble that Nehemiah couldn't pass through parts at the temple. There was so much debris, so much rubble, he couldn't even fit through on a donkey. You're talking destruction everywhere. What the Babylonians did, this is important historically, what they did is they took the best of the Israelites, the most capable, the most wealthy, they took them and exiled them out, and they left the poorest of the poor and the least skilled workers they left in Jerusalem. By the time Ezra enters into Jerusalem, and by the way, Cyrus, the king of, uh, of Persia, allows the Israelites to go back in, which is miraculous in itself. He allows them to go back in and to begin to rebuild the temple. They go into Jerusalem and there was just destruction everywhere. And I think it was one of those scenes, like, have you seen the pictures of Syria? Right? Aleppo, which is the heart of, of the Syrian fighting. 
Do you find any building that's not just completely annihilated? I haven't seen one. You look at the pictures and you just see destruction and, and people are living in these piles of rubble and you can't believe when you look at the pictures and you see these little kids coming out of these buildings, it's so unbelievable. This is today. This is right now. And you look at Syria and there's just so much destruction that you look at it and you're like, how, how can they ever rebuild? Ezra is an incredible person because he comes, into, he comes into Jerusalem, he assesses it, he looks around and he says, you know what, we have a remnant, we're going to start to rebuild. We're going to trust God and we're going to start to rebuild. So they begin to rebuild, and I'm not really going to talk about that because what really connected with me as I was reading Isaiah, was, or Ezra rather, was Ezra's attitude and his call to repentance. I'm going to go back and reread what Bill had read. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way since we had told the king the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him and the power of his wrath against all who forsake him. By the way, did they, did they encounter opposition when they rebuilt the temple? Absolutely. Multiple times this project was shut down and people came in and they were trying to kill all the Israelites. But they persisted and they trust God. Verse 23, so we fasted and implored our God for this and he listened to our entreaty. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. By the way, Ezra is hearing this when they rebuilt this temple. They rebuild this temple, they dedicate this temple, and now they're, they're going to be worshiping God, and, and everything's on this wonderful path after they just met obstacle after obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And so they finally, Ezra comes back and he's like, man, I have this core group of people and we're going to come and we're going to worship God and we're going to give him our all. And this report comes back. Ezra, buddy, these people that are left have married all these people who are foreigners and are full of idolatry. And they've had kids to these foreign women, contrary to what the Bible says, and they've, they've not listened to God in their hearts. If you think that they're going to come and they're going to worship God, we're going to be back in the same place that we were just a few years ago. For they've taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy, the holy race, that is Israel, has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men have been foremost. In other words, it's the leaders of Israel who are, they're, they're the ones who have done this and set the example for the other people. And as soon as Ezra heard this, he says, as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak. And pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. By the way, Ezra was not being a drama king. <laughs> um, Ezra was upset. He was grieved. And he begins ripping chunks out of his hair. By the way, this is a phenomenon that happens. Um, I've actually seen this with people who are in extremely incredible um, states of anxiety. especially more with women than men, but they begin to rip chunks of hair out. They'll have big bald spots. They once had a beautiful head of hair. They'll have these spots that are completely bald where they've ripped their hair out from what? From stress. He tears his garment and his cloak. He pulls hair from his beard. He pulls hair from his head. And then all who trembled at the words of God is of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, 
I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. I'm going to continue from there because I, I didn't type this up, but I just think this is, this is so important. He says, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, listen to this prayer. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame, as, is, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God. Notice that he's not saying, God, you blessed us, you allowed us to build this temple, and now we're invincible. He says, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken our, your commandments, which you commanded by your servants and prophets, saying, The land that you are entering, take possession of it. It is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give our, uh, your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance for your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, seeing that you our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved. He's talking about the exoduses. God, you came in and the Assyrians came in and they took the north away. The Babylonians came in and it was just ruthless and people were dying and, and, and you exiled them and you still didn't give us what we deserved. You punished us less than we deserved. And now, verse 14, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the people who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant or any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. For we have left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt. No one can stand before you because of this. And then he goes on, and, 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 and Ezra leads the way. And this is what, when I read Ezra, I'm like, man, this man is just an incredible man of integrity and peace. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, Ezra is a peacemaker. Because Ezra spoke kindly to the people. And he just wept in front of them. He's like, guys, what are we doing? And they begin to separate themselves. And I can't imagine, I can't begin to imagine. This is not like they, they were like, oh, yeah, we sinned and, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going we're gonna to be cool with God. Like, they divorced their wives and sent their wives and their children. This is their families. And my heart gets ripped out when I read Ezra and I look at this and I'm like, man, these people did what was right. At a great cost. It cost them their families. Literally. You remember the words of Jesus? Right? Anyone who does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Jesus wasn't saying, I, you need to go hate your family. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, discipleship comes at a great cost. Following God and doing what's right comes at a great cost. 
Are you willing to count that cost and take up your cross and follow me? This is the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, are you willing to take up your own cross, to be willing to die for me, to be willing to give up everything? He's not just talking about physical death. Jesus is saying, are you willing to carry this thing behind you and to lay everything down for my name's sake? And if you are, he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to bless you and you're going to find health and you're going to find peace and you're going to find, you're going to find this salvation. And that's what Jesus preached. Uh, we're doing a class, by the way, if you are missing the life of Christ class that we just began, you are missing an incredible class. Uh, we just started the life of Christ in the adult class and I am pumped about it. We're talking about Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission was to go out to preach good news to the poor and to set captives free and to preach good news to them, to liberate them from the oppression that they experienced. And Jesus, that's what drove him. That was his mission. That's why he was here. So Ezra is just a reminder to us that we serve an incredible God. We serve a God who's just, and righteous, like we said, Psalm 89, verse 14. The foundation of your throne is righteousness and justice, and steadfast love goes ever before you. We serve a righteous and a just and a loving God who grants us mercy, who gives us grace, who gives us salvation, and that's good news. I know it's good news for me. <laughs> I, we talked about it in class this morning a little bit. Paul's words resonate pretty clearly with me when Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Paul's speaking my language. Paul's speaking my language. See, this is good news. You can't help but to read Ezra and say, man, what an awesome God we serve. It's incredible. We owe our lives to him. I just want to encourage you this week as we go out to just pour over uh, Ezra. And just read it over and over and really digest Ezra. And next week is, oh, I won't be here next Sunday. I was going to stay next week as we go into Nehemiah, but I, I won't be here. Um, we'll pick up Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is incredible. Read over it as well. It's an awesome, awesome reminder of the God who we serve. We serve an incredible God. Go out and tell people, please, I beg you, share that with people and tell them, if your life is in shambles, don't give up hope. You know what the suicide rate is right now in the United States? It's pretty bad. Young people, they're the ones taking their lives. You know why? They're giving up hope. They see the rubble, and they don't see a way out. Give them Ezra. For people who are really struggling, don't give them the peppy verses like, Jesus will take care of your birth. Give them Ezra. Say, look, here's somebody who walked in the trenches of, of just horrible destruction and overcame because of God. And that's the God who we serve. We serve an incredible God. If there's anybody who has any prayer needs or anybody who's not yet taken that step to put Christ on a baptism, we invite you to do that. You can come forward or our shepherds will be in the back as we stand and sing.